Hello, Abutis from around the world. My name is Kais, and I'm 11 years old, and I live in Montreal, Canada. Welcome to our Abut Zoom session with me and my co-host, Lucy, who's also 11 years old and currently lives in Seattle, Washington. We'll be interviewing our guest chain maker, Zaylan Titcomb, who is also based in Seattle. Zaylan is the co-owner of XII Brands, which includes Five Ultimate, Savage Apparel, and Aria Discs all of which companies that create premium products for the ultimate community and beyond. His business is a responsible business that pays special attention to the environment, to its impact on the community, to diversity, and to gender equality. Leland's work contributes to several sustainable development goals, particularly to SDG number 12, responsible consumption and production, yeah, and Lucy and I will be asking questions to Zaylan about his background, his journey, his work, his skills, and his impact. We hope that you will enjoy the session, and I, will, and I will now be handing you over to Lucy to ask the first question. Hello. Um, now, Zaylan, I have actually um, quite a few questions. Um, what is your job like? Uh, how, how is the formatting that you like it to be? Well, most of the work that I do these days with Ultimate Frisbee is uh, on a strategy level. And so when we, when we talk about um, the variety of different brands that are associated underneath XII company, um, those are all brands that I started building a long time ago. And I did a lot, a lot of work on. And then we got to a point where we combined with some other brands too. So it was a bunch of mergers that got together. And right now, my main role within that uh, ecosystem, within that group of brands, is not so much day to day. It's more has to do with long term strategy and big picture planning. And so it's something that I, I really enjoy doing. It's problem solving. Um, it's thinking about the future. It's thinking about far into the future. Um, and it is it's. Uh, also at the same time challenging because we don't know what the future is going to look like, <laughs> right? Uh, right? If you do, if you do happen to know, let me know because that would be really helpful. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, I, I actually have a couple questions about how your job can impact people around you and the world around you. Like how, how your business can affect a problem in the world. Hmm, that's a great question. Um, to answer that, I'd like to mention a little bit about the sport of ultimate Frisbee. So, um, it is a, it's a slightly unique sport. It's not super common or popular the way football, American football or soccer or baseball are. Um, but it is, it does have a lot of people that play it all around the world. Um, one of the really unique, cool attributes about ultimate Frisbee, um, is that when you're playing against another team, there's no referee. So uh, when you when you when a foul happens on the field, you don't go ahead and right away look towards the referee to make the call. You actually have to make the call and discuss the foul with the other player, which is really unique because you have to respect them and you have to trust them and you have to discuss the outcome with them and come up with a resolution without having to ask somebody else to judge the situation. And so when you think about that and how it impacts the rest of the world, imagine if you got in a fender bender or if you got in uh, some sort of argument with somebody, you didn't have to call the police. You would just be able to figure it out on yourself, on your own. And so um, the work that we do, the businesses that we run, don't specifically address that part of the sport. That's part of the sport. It's built that way. But what it does do is that we create products that let people feel an identity associated with Ultimate. So when we make a really cool jersey that is an Ultimate jersey and someone wears that jersey, in a sense, they're wearing the idea that we can resolve conflict without having to call the referee over. And we're not going to cheat when the referee's not looking. That we're going to have a level of trust and integrity with the other people that we interact with. So that's one of the big ways that, that by creating these sorts of identity pieces, 
clothing specifically, it allows people to own that identity and then bring some of those benefits out into the world. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does actually. Um, okay. It's a very, it's very, I thought about that question specifically because I, I heard a lot. Um, when I answered the first question, I realized that it's a very important job, especially when it comes to ultimate frisbee because sports is very important to people, especially to athletes who like specialize in the sport. Um, so I was wondering what, what's like a, what's the biggest goal for your company? What, what is something that you're hoping to happen when coronavirus is over? Oh boy. Coronavirus has been really hard for sports, as you can imagine. Um, it's made it difficult for groups to get together uh, and play. So um, for the actual operation of the business, it's been really tough because no one's buying any sports gear. <laughs> I mean, there are certain sports, of course, that are succeeding, but the team sports like Ultimate Frisbee, it's seven on seven on the field and you're running around and you're running into each other and you can't, you're not running into each other because it's non-contact, but you can't stay six feet apart and still play ultimate. So it's made it really difficult for the business to sell things. But at the same time, what it has allowed us to do is to take a step back and think about what's the most important thing about the sport and what's the most important thing about the community and connecting people and, and like doubling down on some of these values that are unique to ultimate. I mean, I talked about the, the no referees and the self-officiation, but there's also this other layer where ultimate is one of the only sports where all the way up to the world championship level, um, men and women play on the field on the same team together. So you have this like this idea of gender equity that comes into sports where you don't otherwise have that in a lot of other places. If you look at most popular sports, certainly in the United States, they're very dominated by male players. Now on the flip side, if you look at Ultimate Frisbee, you have this opportunity to highlight and even center a lot of people that don't typically, a lot of the athletes you're mentioning, who don't typically get a spotlight in everyday society. So to be an excellent athlete and for us to still be able to brand, be a brand and think about that and think about how we're talking about that on social media and think about how we're talking about that in our plans post COVID, has been really, really interesting. It's, it's tough because we don't have the sales, so revenue's down, but at the same time, you know, we get to still be who we are as a brand and try and make those uh, connections deeper to the concepts behind what the sport stands for. Great. Um, so that brings me to my point about how, is there anything that you would change your company to make it successful in your way, your own way? Hmm, that's interesting. The, when we think about the direction or the strategy of our company, um, we typically identify it as being only as strong as the, the combination of everybody's ideas, right? So there's a lot of people who are working on our business together. Um, and I'm not just talking about the leadership and the management team, I'm talking top to bottom. And so this is a little bit changing your question or not really answering your question because I don't really, I don't really want a magic wand to wave it, to change it to what I would want it to be. Um, my dream would be to make sure that we are always listening to everybody's opinion and collaborating together to actually try and find the best outcome. Because sometimes, uh, the best ideas come from places you would least expect them to come from. So that's sort of a short, different answer to your question. Is that all right? No, that's actually what I expected you to answer to. So there you go. <laughs> oh boy. You've got me, Lizzie. <laughs> um, what is, what is your motivation to do this work? Have you experienced this sport in your, in your own career with sports or have you just watched a game and you thought, Hey, I should do this or, um, I've, I've played ultimate for a long time. Um, and so I've had the opportunity to be the, the, the user of the product. And so by identifying some of the challenges that I originally thought of there is that there wasn't really a great, um, 
when I first started playing, there wasn't a brand that really said, this is what I believe in for the sport. And I, I love it for these reasons. And so that was what originally inspired us and me to try and create something that gave an identity and a meaning and a culture and an ethos to Ultimate Frisbee. Um, and we, we sort of started with the clothing brand and then we expanded to make um, the top, top quality Ultimate Frisbee disc that's out there. Um, and so that was able to expand the sport even more. And so it does drive me to think about if I do this well, other people will have the opportunity to play the way that I got to play and the way that I fell in love with it. And if they don't like it, then that's fine. Everybody has different preferences. But the more options there are for people, then perhaps there's a better chance to get more people into this world of inclusivity of gender and of, you know, self-officiation and integrity and the levels of teamwork and cooperation that are involved there. They're just life skill sets that I think are, I think are awesome. I like them. Um, so if I can make those more available to other people, um, that fires me up. All right. It's a, again, that's, expect, that's exactly what I expected you to say. <laughs> um, um, what, what do you think is going to be the next big product that might get you the biggest satisfaction in your company? Ooh. Um, well, one of the things that we're working on these days is a, um, uh, a live in-person game day experience for Ultimate Frisbee. So sort of like a professional sports version of the sport, because it's never really been big enough to draw big crowds at a stadium the way a big baseball or a soccer game would. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way to make it really fun for a lot of people to come and watch the sport and learn about it and see how there's both genders on the team on the same field and everyone's awesome and everyone's playing and, and competing at the heart at their hardest, running their hardest, trying their hardest, diving for big catches in that sort of spectacle of sport. And I think that the, I would be really, really excited if we could get that to the next level so that we would have thousands of people coming to watch a game because it's fun, because it's what you would want to do on a Saturday. And so we're working pretty hard right now to have that happen here in Seattle and our numbers are getting bigger. Um, and we have a stadium and we have a mascot and we have a halftime show and we have concessions. And so it's all the pieces are coming together, but really to make it, to make it big would be a really cool thing. My brother works a lot on that right now. And so I'm helping him with that. Hmm. Um, I, I've also been wondering, this is the most interesting question in my opinion that I feel like you're going to have a pretty short answer about, but an interesting answer. What is something you did for your company to make it better, more improved? Hmm. I have a, I have a, a, I have a good little short one. It's maybe not the best thing, but it's an interesting one. And that was that at a certain point, uh, I was part of the leadership team of the company. And we realized that we were not necessarily the best people to be running the company. So we were in charge, but we realized that in order for the company to do better, we needed to step aside and hire somebody else who was going to do a better job than we were. So in one sense, if you look at it in a really pessimistic way, we sort of fired ourselves, <laughs> right? It sounds a little silly, but really when you're at the core of the business and you really want it to succeed, Sometimes you have to acknowledge and recognize when it's time to step back and let someone else take the reins who is better than you at the job. And that was, that was a really interesting transition for us. Awesome. Um, I actually assumed that it was going to be something like, oh, I got donuts for my company or <laughs> I got donuts and had to go wait in a 30 minute line. I thought it was going to be something like that. It's a way better answer than I expected. Um, if you if you took a big old look of your company, what 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 would you think of your company's works workspace? Like, what does your workspace look like? 
Well, it's been very different since uh, COVID's come to come to light, right? So before that, we had a pretty cool open office space, very creative, um, pretty wacky. Like you don't walk into a law firm or a corporate headquarters. It doesn't really look like what our office looks like. It's kind of a little bit more Pee Wee Herman, Willy Wonka. It's got goofy stuff on the walls and a lot of different colors. And um, I think that 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 a company culture is often um, goes hand in hand with the way that the space is used or the space is designed. So we value collaboration. So it's, you know, people sit where they want to sit with their desks and we value creativity. So it's not just a black and white walls and like boring art or something like that. No offense to anybody else, but <laughs> you know, it's a goofy, it was a goofy space, not in a bad way, goofy, goofy and like a creative and fun space, an atmosphere that encourages uh, wanting to come in and enjoy. Like when I walk into that building, it felt good. It felt like I wanted to be there. Um, now with COVID, it's been a little more challenging. So um, remote work, obviously, y'all know about that. It is. It has made it hard to maintain some of that um, that special sauce, uh, but we do our best. All right, that's that's actually a very amazing answer. I would have expected you to say that. But there, here we are. Um, what what do you like most about the city that is in your your workspace? Like, what what is something that just clicks with your workspace in the city? Mm. Um, I think uh, every city. I think we're what we're working with these days is we get to interact with people from all over the world. And sometimes, if we're just behind a screen here, the two of us talking. It's a little bit challenging to see beyond just us individually. But for me, for example, to be able to talk to Kais, um, there, there is a level of needing to understand what it's like to be in Seattle for me and what it's like for his environment in Montreal, because those are two very different cities. And I feel like Seattle has this element of, create, of like creativity. It's a little bit crunchy. It's a little bit alternative. And it works well for an alternative sport like Ultimate Frisbee, which is one of the reasons I think those things happen to come to fruition in the same city, but not because Seattle's a better city than any other city, it's just different. And I think that's, it's important to acknowledge for your question that, that there is a unique element of geography to the way that the culture of a company or the culture of a city promotes a certain type of company or a certain type of organization. And every city around the world is different. There's amazing things going on in cities that sometimes we don't even know about because we don't stop and take a second to acknowledge, like, where is this person from? What's their background? And where are they coming from? That, that's a very deep, deep answer and a very... <laughs> Sorry, Lucy. <laughs> it's, not, well, it's not like that, but it's, there's, it's very... There's great donuts in Seattle, too. <laughs> Um, what, what do you think if, so for example, if your business took off, like it was the number one ultimate Frisbee business, would you, and you got like a huge paycheck and would you divide it evenly or would you like, would you, would you like be fair with your fellow coworkers and would you be like excited that you were going to be let's say a millionaire oh boy in quotes well, it, that all i think that all depends on what an individual person's goals are because money's great but it's not the only thing in the world right so if the business made a ton of money the first thing that we do is make sure everybody got what they needed got a fair share of it right because to be honest it's an alternative sport and it's not it's not the NFL or it's not Nike or it's not one of these really big businesses. They have lots and lots of money. <laughs> you know, it's, it is still generally speaking a small business. And so for a lot of people that um, ourselves included that have worked on it, we've never really done it to make lots of money, right? You make some money, you make enough money to live on, but the real payout is getting to be part of the sport and being part of the reason why people play the sport. Um, so, that's sort of a half answer. Yes, if we made a bunch of money, everyone would get a, a great balance of it all, right? But at the end of the day, the success actually 
if we were that big, we would also be celebrating how big we got because it would be the opportunity to show more people how great Ultimate is or how great we think it is. Everyone can have their own decision, right? Right. Um, I, I have a pretty short, quick uh, question for you. What inspired you to what, who kind of motivated you to do what you loved? Like oh, who? Um, I would have to point uh, first and foremost to a, a woman named, named Mary Lowry, who was a, a teacher of mine. Um, she was an amazing teacher and she also happened to be a really amazing Frisbee player. And she was some of the early inspiration that got me and my siblings so encaptured with the sport. And so she was a big part of why we ended up doing what we're doing. Um, I would say that's a, that's a really easy one to point to. There's a lot of other business folks. Um, I mean, Reem is a great example of someone who just takes things and makes them happen and does it in a really creative way and includes lots of people like getting access and getting exposure to all the different ideas that we, we go through in our careers from really unique and uh, uh, creative and successful people. They all play a role. And if you're not borrowing or learning from people along the way, uh, it's really hard to, to make a lot of progress. But the original spark was definitely Mary Lowry. But along the way, there's just been so many people that have inspired me to think about things differently and and how to grow and how to maybe change something around to have a better impact or a better outcome. Awesome, that is really just amazing. Um, here... that. Oh, go ahead. Pardon? Yeah. I also had a teacher that was actually a professional in the Frisbee. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then, awesome. we brought, then I brought a Frisbee to school one day and then there were like 20 people playing in a game of Ultimate Frisbee across the field. Nice. It was very fun. Fantastic. I have a pretty um, related question. What are your interests outside of work? Like, what are some other sports or hobbies that you like to do? Mm, I like to spend time outdoors. Um, I like to make sure that I'm constantly, if possible, uh, which isn't possible very often, but inspired by nature and reminded of how amazing nature is on its own. Here we spend all of our time to like, build businesses and build sports and build companies and build lives and you know be creative and then right outside of our cities there's nature which is doing it naturally and has been doing it naturally forever so <laughs> um i'm a bit of a closet environmentalist when it comes to that um uh, other than that uh, spending time with my family spending time with friends um being creative in the kitchen sometimes making mistakes uh and then laughing about it. Um, yeah. Um, what, what's something that you did when you were a child besides Ultimate Frisbee? Like, did you do soccer? Did you do cross? Did you do football? Did you do any hobbies besides sports, et cetera? Um, yeah. I read a lot of books. Um, I built a lot of forts, tree forts and stuff. Um, uh, I was lucky as a kid to have the opportunity to be, um, to grow up in two different countries. So I was, um, lived part of my life here in the United States and part of my life in Italy. And so I feel like, while well, at the time it wasn't, didn't feel like it was that cool. Um, when I got older, I realized that there's a part of our brains that, um, sorry, a part of my brain that I think developed in a certain way to see uh, multiple systems. And the ability to see multiple systems, I think, helps me think about strategies in a way that allows for multiple outcomes. Um, and so it was a unique thing growing up, seeing how the United States worked and seeing how Italy worked and seeing like speaking English and speaking Italian and this idea of multiple different systems sort of teaches your brain that there are a lot of different systems out there. And it sort of sets the stage for uh, exploration into, you know, possibilities that you might not otherwise realize that were there. So 
Um, that was a big part of my upbringing. I sometimes forget about it, but I think it had a lot to do to define me, define who I am today. That's, that's really inspirational. Um, my, my brother has actually, he, he takes, he, when he was in kindergarten, he had to electively take a Spanish class or a language, language uh, class and he chose Spanish. And he's been doing Spanish ever since and he's a junior or a junior in high school. So right now he could literally go to Mexico and just actually live there and talk in Spanish. And I thought about it one time and I thought it's very interesting how someone can can produce another language just in their head when they've learned when they've just learned it over a couple of years when on the other hand they've lived in a language for their entire life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kais, do you have a set of questions that you want to jump into as well? I mean, I don't have many questions, but I do have okay. some questions. Sure. I just want I want to make sure that we get some stuff in from you too in case we get cut off here accidentally. All right. Well, uh, what is your favorite sport besides ultimate frisbee? Oh, uh, I'm gonna say soccer. That's a, a easy one. I played a lot of soccer, and it's got some similarities to ultimate too. Eh. I don't think it has many similarities to it, but yeah. <laughs> uh, what like other languages can you speak other than English, if there are any? Um, I lived in China for six years, and over the time I was there, I picked up Chinese, so I do speak Chinese. And on top of that, I also speak uh, a little bit of French. I thought you'd know how to speak Italian, because you grew up there, as you said. I, I do speak Italian as well. That's in addition to Italian and English. There's, there's a letter too. I mean, well, uh, I don't have any more questions. I didn't think of many. <laughs> I just thought of those two during this time. Gotcha. Cool. I mean, so unless Lucy has any more questions. Um, I'm good. I, I have a couple of side questions, but for now, I'm great. Um, then we end it, but I mean, if you want to ask your side questions, go ahead. We still have a while. Okay. Um, actually adding on to your question case, um, like, from from your perspective and like like from uh, from you telling us your perspective from ultimate frisbee and you learning all these different languages like mandarin Ch or, sorry chinese uh all in italian all this stuff and a bit of french um i i was wondering since i was thinking to myself wow He's kind of a jack of all trades. And um, I was wondering, do you like, is there something in particular that you do, like a hobby that you do not particular like? Like, hmm. I've never thought about that. That's a great question. Um, something I don't particularly like. Uh, I don't naturally listen to a lot of music. I think I have to push myself to listen to music. I know that's something that a lot of people enjoy, um, but my natural instinct when I get in the car and drive is not really to put the radio on. Um, so some people call music a hobby, and maybe it's because I don't think of it quite as much as a hobby, maybe that counts as my, it's a hobby that I don't really like as much. <laughs> I mean, well, the people who call music a hobby are probably people who actually like play music. I don't, I most definitely don't think that listening to music would count as a hobby ever. Gotcha. Well, it would count as a hobby if you played an instrument, like the trumpet. I mean, like I said, it wouldn't count if you just listened to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, if you, like, yeah. listen to, like, some, like, jazz orchestra, it's not really much of a hobby if you just sit down and listen to some music. I mean, well, there are people. There are people that uh, that spend most of their lives just sitting down and listening to jazz orchestras. They're just maybe not in the mainstream. It's not an everyday hobby. It's not a hobby that you maybe like walk down the street and the first person you meet is a jazz orchestra expert hobbyist. <laughs> uh, 
um, I don't know. It's interesting. What what would you if you two had to had to answer that question back? Do you have a hobby that you don't like, or a specific hobby that you don't think you like? Uh, if it was anything, it'd be a sport that I don't like. I mean, I guess golf. I definitely don't like golf. Yeah, like golf. Very boring. Is... Very slow. Very slow game. Exactly. You're just hitting a ball to get it in the hole, but it's very precise and it goes on and on and on and on and on. Until it goes on. Exactly. <laughs> Until someone gets it in the hole and then there's like a two hour break, like a half time. Like, ha like, why do you need two hours? <laughs> okay. I mean, I it don't can be like a little golf bit because silly. it's like slower paced. I mean, a better game would probably be like basketball or soccer because of how fast it goes. Kind of like ultimate frisbee, which doesn't go pretty fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it goes so much faster. You get so much more tired. And when somebody calls a timeout, it's only a minute, and half time is like thirty minutes. Yeah, like, like this. You just yeah. gotta keep punches going. Keep yeah, there are also. If you had to stretch the the um, the question a little bit, there's a re another reason that I personally don't particularly like golf because it takes up a lot of space in mm. cities. Mm. When you think of all that green space and all the water it takes, um, I I fully respect the people that enjoy golf itself, but it mm. tends to be more rich people and it tends to be kind of exclusive. And sometimes I wonder if that space that is taken up by a golf course would be much better used if it was a public park for everybody to enjoy. So, I mean, before we end the interview, I have one more question for you. Do you have any advice for somebody who wants to start a business like you did? Oh boy, it takes a lot of work, it takes some good ideas but I think it takes a good team is the piece of advice that I would give you. If you have good people around you that you trust, you can make the hard decisions and you can make, make a business happen. So thank you, Zaylin and Lucy for the great discussion and for everything we learned today. Thank you, Abutus, for listening to this interview. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can hear about upcoming sessions with other change makers. And please also tell your friends about Abut and share our social media links with them. <laughs>